Merry Christmas time, beautiful. So for the few brunches in the room, most of us love Christmas. It's a great time of the year to take time to, to reflect and celebrate and keep too much regrets of next year or tomorrow, depending on how you do today. But um, it is really lovely to have you here this morning. I know there's lots of family and friends from out of town, gosh, from Victoria, Joburg, all around. It's really amazing to have you here today. And I thought about it this morning. This will be the 12th Christmas in a row that I'm, I'm sharing the message. And then I saw Eugene and Wendy here from 3 I said, okay, I have to change because that was the one I used two years ago. I've got to find the one I used five years ago. So have you been, if you've been around for 12 years, welcome. But, um, Monique, my gorgeous wife, doesn't put any pressure on me. She says to me, can you come up with some fresh revelation and something new? <laughs> I'm thinking, I haven't been able to do that for 2,000 years because it's the same story, just told in different ways. But this morning we're going to give it a test. Is that good? So, Father, I thank you so much for this amazing opportunity we have to be together. Thank you for this family. Thank you for your grace that's upon all of us here today. That we would have the most amazing morning together that you're name would be lifted high above everything else, Jesus. I pray that the words of my mouth, Lord God, the meditation of my heart, the words that I bring today would bring freedom and grace to people's lives. Because we do celebrate the most amazing thing that's ever happened in human history. And that's you, Jesus. Amen. 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 So the, the scripture I wanted to use this morning was from 1 John chapter 1. And if you've got your Bible, you can turn there. If you want me to turn this noise air condition off, I think that's got the control. You're going to decide, hot or noise? Noise. <laughs> okay, it goes like this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, that which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared and it has, and, and we have seen it and testified to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son Jesus. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message that we have heard from Him and declare to you God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. And so this morning what we're going to look at with the Christmas message is the incarnation of Jesus, the coming of God to the earth. And you want to look at some of the things that that does for us and what makes Christmas so special and why it is important for us as believers to sit back and take a moment to say, okay, let's get our heads and hearts around this fact that God came to the earth. The incarnation is the word that the theologians would use. Incarnation means the one who is eternal. God came in human flesh. He came to the earth and made his appearance to us. And uh, if you look at what he is saying here, down. Yeah, now this thing jams up. There we go. So when we sing Christmas carols, remember the one that John, um, that Charles Wesley wrote, the one, you know, Hark the Herald Angel sings, Veiled in flesh, Godhead, and see, Hail the, the deity incarnate. It's God came to earth. And we celebrate that um, over the last few weeks, this understanding that this um, idea of the creator of all things humbles himself. It comes in the form of a Hebrew. And so there's lots of things we're going to look at this morning, what that does. And so the first teaching that he does is, is around Christmas. He speaks about why Christmas. And so for me, the amazing thing is, I thought about this. As a, as a parent, I don't even want my kids to go to the bathroom by themselves in a public space. You say to your kids, hey, like, go. And I've got a few of them, go together. Go in the pack. But think about God, the creator of all things. He sends his son to the most hostile place. Earth. It's arrogant, it's hostile, it's got the kings of those times were arrogant. I don't think any more arrogant than today, but they were arrogant, they had the life, they had the, they had people's lives in their very hands. And the father says, I'm gonna send a son to that. And into that situation, Jesus appears in the form of a baby. And we looked at that, I think it was last week, what that meant for him to come in the form of a baby. But so the, the big first point this morning is the incarnation. It's actually that Jesus came. And what we need to understand about the incarnation is two things. First, it's doctrinal, it's doctrine, and I'll look at what that means in a moment. But secondly, which for me is 
it's quite important for us to get our hands around. It's actually historical. In the, in the language that John uses, he says, these are things that I've seen. These are things that I've heard. I've seen him. I've touched him. I've been with him. It's not a story about someone that he heard about. It's a first-hand account. You see that? It says, that which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, with, and which we have touched with our own hands. So John would have seen Jesus. He would have smelt his, 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 his body. He would have felt his body. He would have seen him. He would have been walking with him. It's a first-hand account. And as I've looked at this over this last week, is in ancient writings, which makes this a doctrine historical, or this account historical, is in ancient literature, what they would do was if they were going to write something, like if you look at Jesus, it says when Jesus was walking in the water, it says when he was three and a half miles away, three and a half meters away from the boat, the disciples called out to him. Remember that. What they say, this is a first-hand account. When they write legends, they wouldn't put such detail into it. So if you've read Homer or you've read the stories of Achilles and um, Troy, those are legends. And they would never add that kind of detail into the story. They would just say, they would just say that you know, Achilles and Hector were fighting 2.3 miles from the door. They, just, they had a fight. Are you with me? So, that, so he's saying to you, what you've got to understand, this is doctrine, it's doctrine, but it's also historical. And he came. It's a massive thing. I know we kind of just say, ah, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, he came. But I want us to just this morning allow ourselves to say, well, what does that actually mean? It's not a legend. Because most people are quite happy with the legend of Jesus. The story of this Jesus and the, the fact that, you know, he came to speak good will to all men. And, and, and it's a great story. But actually, what he's saying is, no, no, the God of heaven, the creator and sustainer of all things, came to earth. And when he came to earth, there was not a lot of fanfare. You know, we make a lot of fanfare when we do the, the story of the, the, um, the nativity and the, the angel and the star and all that stuff. But actually, in, in actual accounts, there was three, few wise men. We say three, but the Bible doesn't say three. There were a couple of wise men, a couple of shepherds. There was Joseph and Mary. So it wasn't this big noise. It was just this, you think about this massive thing that's happening. He comes in. And actually, the only cry you probably would have heard was the cry of Jesus, the baby Jesus. In his first coming, came to do it very humbly, very subversively into the earth, and it radically impacts and changes human history. So I want us to understand that it's very, very historical. Because when you get your head around the fact that it actually happened, then it starts to affect the way we actually live. Not just on Christmas Day when we come to church, which is amazing and lovely to see you. And I hope I stir you in your heart this morning to say, actually, I want to understand this more for my life and what the implications of this has for me. Because when we understand that the doctrine is that Jesus came, it's something we can build our lives on. A doctrine basically is something we believe, something we commit to, something we base our lives on. So people will, actually, everyone has doctrine of some kind. Everyone has got a philosophy or an idea they're living their lives around which separates them from everyone else or allows them of someone. We as believers have the doctrine of Jesus and it came to the earth. You see, the text says that the invisible became visible. So God who was invisible became visible in human form. That's the doctrine we believe. In other words, God became human. Okay? So it's important to understand why did He become human? Because the ideal being God became the real. The divine took up human nature this is, not a this is not a specific doctrine, but it is unique. No, sorry, it's not only specific, but it's unique. It's a very unique doctrine that God came in human form. The divine became human. The inconceivable or the invisible became visible. That's what distinguishes us from everything else on the earth. Every other philosophy, ideology is the doctrine of Jesus. Okay. What I realize is, in looking at this, a lot of other religions out there talk about the incarnation um, or the eminence of God because he, He's eminent means He's in all things, he, he, He's around us, he's, he's in everything. And so the, the, the Hindus and the Buddhists will say God is so um, eminent that He's in all things. He's in the trees, He's in the plants, He's in everything. Christianity says no, He's not in everything. He created everything, but He's incarnated in Jesus. Very unique in Jesus. The other family of religions out there, like Judaism and Islam, will say no, that he's so transcendent that he would never come in human form. That would be blasphemy for them. But we say God is so eminent 
And he's so transcendent that he can do it, but he only does it once in the form of Jesus. That's what distinguishes us from everything else. It's actually, we believe that God is imminent, he's transcendent, but he's also incarnate. He came in human form. Yeah, I'm trying to knock this nail on the ground. I got it. Can, you, can I move on, please, Mark? Change it. I love what he says. These are the things we saw. We saw him do this. We saw, we heard him say this. We felt him do this. And we're like really in the moment. I love that. And what's amazing about that is, again, for the, the historical reality is, it says that 500 people witnessed the resurrected Jesus. 500 people, okay? So John speaks about that later. He says, no, there were, there were 500 witnesses. And what again makes this historically sad or historically reliable is that these scriptures were written 50 years after the event. Okay? So you think about it, 50 years, are either the, the stupidest liars ever, because why would they say, no, 500 people saw Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and they would, some of those 500 would still be alive in the Kidron Valley. So they were able to corroborate, is that the right word, what he is saying. No, no, we were there. We saw that. So 2,000 years later, we have to put faith into the fact that we believe that 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus. When this was actually said, they were still around to either confirm or deny that. So we can, like I said a few times, our faith is something we can say. It's not just blind, oh, we have to believe this whole story. No, no, it's built on that. It's built on something that is historically sound. Something that we can actually put into practice and go to the bank on. Say back? Go to the bank on this one. When John says, I saw him, I felt him, I heard him, with my, I'd seen him with my own eyes, I heard him with my own ears. Everyone would have known immediately that he was claiming to be an eyewitness. So okay, what's the big deal about this? Well, this sets us apart from everything else. When you understand that the fact that Jesus was God came in, in human flesh, I said to my kids on the way, why is it so important that everyone's wearing red and, red and white? What is the deal with the red and white? Father Christmas? Blood. The blood of Jesus. What does the blood of Jesus do? He came in human form to take on the, the, the sin of the world. He takes it into his body. And with his blood, he makes us righteous. He makes us holy. So when we get our heads around the fact that the, the, the eternal God comes in human form, takes on human flesh, he lived a life that you and I could never have lived. He dies a death that we should have died. So that when we walk upon earth, we walk, we walk the life He walked. We can be free. But the beautiful thing about Christmas, the beautiful thing that makes it um, amazing this morning is that actually we have freedom. So Keller says that in this account, John says that we now have fellowship with Him. It's deeply mystical. We have union with God. There was a great book written years ago called The Mystical Union. Because of this Incarnation, because of this death, because of this life, you and I now have fellowship with God. He invites us into his into a relationship with Him that we now have fellowship. John says we have fellowship with Him. For me, I want Christmas to be so much more for you than oh that was amazing. We had you know for us we did it differently this year. Most of you are having gammon and whatever. We're having biryani. <laughs> I was quite shattered because I asked Nikki's mom to make it and she said, you want white people around or you want Indian bro? I said, well, there's 30 coming to my house. Can you make 29 white and one Indian? <laughs> Christmas is something that should just permeate every aspect of our lives. The thing that I'm trying very hard to do this morning is I want you to understand that the story of Jesus is beautiful, but it's not legend. It's fact. It's mystical. John is speaking, it's mystical. The, the, mystic, the mystical part of it is this, is that the, the eminent or the, the preeminent God, the transcendent God, has made himself knowable, has made himself attainable, made himself into a human form so we can understand and relate to him. And he can relate to us. In doing so, he understands where we are on the earth. He understands what we're facing. He understands the trials you're going through and actually... The, because of his blood, it says that he has purchased men for God and given us a whole new way of living. A whole new way of being human. Because of the incarnation of Jesus. Because of this Christmas thing. It's so much more that you get a good cool present. Actually, you do get a present. You get eternal life. So it's mystical. Does that make sense? It's very mystical. 
It's also very material. So you got to understand what I'm saying about this. The, 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 the fact that Jesus came to you, the fact that He died for you now, the fact that He gives us new life, that He washes us white as snow, that He takes away the, the empty way of life handed to us by our forefathers, takes it away and gives a whole new life, a whole new way of living. It's deeply mystical, but it's also deeply material. See, most religions separate spirit and body. They say the spirit is good and the body is bad. Whatever you do in your body doesn't matter, but what you do in your spirit matters. Actually, that's not true. Jesus came in human form. He came in human form to say, actually, the human body is very important. The earth is very important. You see, most of us would probably still live in the understanding that actually what's happening is we live in this world, we've got to just kind of fuss bait, hang in there, and then one day either Jesus comes back and we escape out the back door, or we die and one day He takes us off to heaven and we go and live in the clouds and in this kind of place in the sky. Escape from us. It's just called escapism. That's not the deal. That's not the Christian theology. That's not the Christian doctrine. What is actually happening is Jesus came to the earth in human form because material is important to God. The earth is important. He created the earth. He created the earth for humans to inhabit the earth. With me? So what he's saying is actually the way that we live on this earth is important. He's not taking us to heaven. He's bringing heaven to earth. The, 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 the God of the universe, He came to the earth in the form of a baby because He's bringing His presence, His goodness, His love and His life into the earth in the form of a baby. Cry, you heard the baby crying. But there's a story coming which I'm trying to get to, I'm trying to build the thing here. <laughs> is He comes in human form because the material world is important. This earth is important. We don't go to heaven, heaven comes here. Do you know that? You understand that? Like a lot of Christianity has lived in this understanding that actually we're going to go to heaven one day. We don't go to heaven one day. Heaven comes to us. We live on this earth. So what we do on this earth as it is important. How you look after your body is important. He's going to raise your body. You're going to get a new body that's going to raise the body. See, when Jesus does it, he says, he has, and he gets raised from the dead, he says he has broken death forever. And the, and the, and the consequence of death is broken. So we get new life. So it's, material, it's deeply material. Deep, it has a deep, a deep impact on the material world around us. It's fiercely relational. What it also does is it, it brings us in relationship with the Father and it makes us have a relationship with one another. So we're able to, at this time of Christmas, think about everyone who is like joy to peace to all men. We want to be kind, we want to be gracious most of the time. Check a couple of those handing out a few slaps at Cornelia, I've heard. In the land there. But, but generally the idea is a time of peace is not. <laughs> but actually that's what the gospel is. The gospel says actually God so loved the world that He gave His Son so that you and I can Im imitate Him instead of putting ourselves first. What is my need? What is that I want? It should be, well, what do those around me need? And what do those around me want? I've watched this morning as gifts were handed out. The joy on the face of the person that gives the gift sometimes is bigger than the joy of the one that gets it. Except for my sons when they get man united. And man said he caps and nearly lost a flip of mine. I mean, I've got two sport billies in my house. I'm like, where? If I bought them surf, they start crying. See, surf t shirt, they cry. I look at them, they look like two sport billies there. Give them soccer kicks, happy days. But there's something in the giving, the person that gives the gift. Is that not true? And so this time, as we understand today, when you go and meet your families, the incarnation, God coming to the earth, the Christmas story is not a Christmas story of cheer, it's a Christmas story of God changing everything of humans. Everything about humanity is actually we are deeply relational. We deeply live in a material world which we have. And oh, that could be a sonic. We live in a material world. <laughs> well, the oaks are over like 20. <laughs> Still nothing, eh? There's a 50 maybe, eh? <laughs> and, and it's deeply relational. The gospel is relational. It's actually God wants you to live in a community. Why? Because it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> People are going to rub you up the wrong way. People are going to irritate you. Gonna, they're going to love you. They're going to carry you through great pain. He says, I love what John says at the end of this. He says, make my joy complete. The amazing thing about Christmas, the amazing thing about the incarnation, the amazing thing about Jesus is that there is a really joy. He doesn't say make my joy. He says, make my joy complete by doing these things. So there's a really a joy that we have because of Jesus. And as we enter into relationships and we love people and we love one another, what happens is we are afraid to, to tie hearts to people or, or get too involved in their life because it's too painful. 
it's too hurt, too much pain even actually to understand. He's saying there's already joy. There's a subterranean. Is that the word? There's a subterranean joy that you have because Jesus comes joy to all men. So as we step out as people, as we step out as the church, and we love one another, even through the pain that people go through, when we love it, we don't have to feel like we're going to lose our joy. And it gets so wrapped up in that thing, we're going to lose who we are. No. We're actually called to love one another because there's a joy that God has already given us because of the coming of Jesus. Because of the incarnation, because of the baby in the manger. It's not a legend, it's a real, actual event. Make sense? Amen. Saying all of that, to say this, when you study the, the advent, the coming of Jesus, Christmas time, it's like the big build up. I said to someone yesterday, I think I might have been Monique or my sister, I said, like, I've got to just sit and enjoy the Christmas Eve moment, because before you know it, and it's already here. They'll be standing in front of 240 people talking. Before you know it, you'll be on your way to holiday. Before you know it, you'll be back from holiday. Before you know it, it'll be the first day of school. Then you look again and it's exam time. You look again, you're putting up the Christmas tree. Life is just phew. It's going so quickly. You have to slow down and say, I just want to enjoy the moment. I want to enjoy this moment because it is fleeting. It is so, so fast. You know, I can't believe it. My, my eldest children, I remember holding them like this. They should say, I used to hold them like this. I remember walking around the hospital. And Dr. Nathan said, they're not rugby balls, they're children. <laughs> now they, I mean, it doesn't take much, but they're my heart. At 18, they one year of school and they're gone. So you've got to learn to enjoy the moment. Yeah. Seriously, people, as, as families, when you go home today, enjoy the moment. Look deep into your heart and say, God has saved me. God has come to you because He's deeply committed to relationships. He's deeply committed to my wholeness. He's deeply committed to the material world around. He's deeply committed to family. He's deeply committed to seeing His presence upon the earth. And that all happened in the first coming of Jesus, in the Advent. But the thing that's amazing, I'll end with this in the last two minutes, as beautiful as that all is, is I want you to have fellowship. He wants you to have fellowship with us. He wants you to believe what He is saying. He wants you to understand the doctrine of Jesus. Paul wants you to understand that we belong in community. This morning, I want you to understand that there's unity in our belief. And that all happened in the coming of Jesus the first time. But the big deal this morning, friend, is the second coming of Jesus. And if you've heard this before, you've been in church many of you, many times, maybe sometimes your first or few times. I want to tell you, as beautiful as and amazing as the first coming of Jesus was, and it was phenomenal. It set us apart from everything else. It changed everything about human ministry. There's going to come a day. I only thought it was this morning. <laughs> Literally, I'm only joking, you really thought it was this morning. She was like, oh, I think he's coming today. <laughs> like, like, but I'm serious. I'm like, I went outside to look and then the light that came out. She <laughs> you know, said, you shouldn't be fear. I'm popping right now, man. He's not coming today. It was like, for real, the day will come when Jesus comes back. And for those that are, well, we have faith in you. Those that believe, in the story of Jesus, in the birth of Jesus. Those that put their faith in that, those that understand the doctrine of that, those that walk with that, understand there will come a day where actually the sky, the Bible says the sky will open. See, in the first coming of Jesus, not many people knew about it. But it's quite phenomenal, actually, just think about this. Not many people knew about it. It happened in an obscure little, like, uh, ocean town, you know, in Bethlehem. Like, Many years ago, a couple of shepherds and a couple of doji magi and a teenager and a not even husband. And it's impacted the world so phenomenal. We just let that alone break your brain trying to figure that out. But the Bible, which is a credible witness, remember, these are our witnesses, says this is going to happen. There will come a day when the scars will open. There will be this trumpet sound in heaven. I'm going to squeak in. He says, the, the, the word that we use as I'm studying more is called, and Kathy will know this in Hendon. And, Although there are many preachers in the room, yeah, that's Eugene or you know, Alex. Don't come and criticize me afterwards, I don't, please. It's, the, this word is Christus Victor. It's like he has the victory. He has the victory over everything. When Jesus came to the earth and when he died, he had victory over every single thing. There's nothing on this world, in this world, that Jesus doesn't stand over. Even your pain and your suffering and your loss and your misunderstanding and your bad decision and your good decision and the bad decision committed against you, whatever it is, there's not a single thing that happens on this planet that Jesus doesn't look over and says, I have authority over that. Yeah. And as believers, our job is to take that authority, 
Bring, like I said, bring that heaven into the earth. How? Through living by faith. By living like this is not a great story. This is actual fact. I'm going to beg my life on this thing. I'm going to live in a way that actually says that's what I believe. Because the day will come when he comes back. And he's not coming back for a church that's just like, hey, this is so sad. This is so hectic. This is coming out. It says, coming for a bride that is radiant and beautiful and powerful and full of grace, full of love. See, we don't believe in the doctrine of good works, just so you know. You're not work your way. You're not, you're not that bad that if you do a few good things, you get it. No. Believe in the doctrine of grace. By grace alone. By the receiving of Jesus alone. Then this is what the Bible says. This is the day that Monique thought was this morning. But yet I was quite relieved to it. <laughs> but the day will come when it will happen. And John says this. The same John that wrote this. He says, I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse. His rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has the name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, the red. And his name is the Word of God. The Word became flesh. It's Jesus. His name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him. Not a couple of shepherds and a couple magi. No, the armies of heaven. You know how hectic that is. Not beautiful that is. That should not scare you. That should give you faith. It says the armies of heaven are following, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. White. See, there's the white. And clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the rock of God. On his robe and on his star, he has written this name, King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. So for me, this Christmas day, as you celebrate with your families, and I pray you love them deeply. I pray you pour out your life. I pray you do more dishes than anyone else. Don't fight about who needs to do the dishes. You do the dishes. Mark down. We can grab the place. <laughs> you out serve. You out love. You out give. You live like Jesus because the incarnation was so magnificent that it changes everything about your perception of the world. And let me tell you, you will live the life that you actually want. Because the day will come. As true as the day did come. For many centuries, they, they prophesied. And Isaiah, I was going to look at it, but I run out of time. And Isaiah says, it says, For unto us a son is given, for unto us is, a, 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 for unto us a son is given, a child is born. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. And of the increase of his government, peace there be no end. That was 1,500 years before the incarnation. They were prophesying, that's coming, that's coming. Then the day happened and he came. I say to you today, friends, the day is coming. The Bible says you must be listening, you must be watching, you must be wide awake. Why? Because what we believe, we want to tell people. Not because we try to convince them to believe in harmony. Because we love them. And they need to believe us. Because He is coming. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Rock Church broadcast service. We have reached the end of our service today. To find out more about who we are, visit our website at www.therock.org.za or contact our office on office at therock.org.za. Please join us again next week, the same time on the same platform.